Hmm. Okay, um, we're live now. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. I am excited that today we're beginning a, a new methodology in our Bible studies, our Bible talk. Uh, over the last year and a half, uh, we've discussed uh, a lot of various theological topics. And uh, there, there are all, all those are available on my, my channel if you want to go back and watch those. A lot of interesting topics, important topics that we've discussed. But today we're going to study the Bible from a different perspective. Uh, rather than a topical study, it, it is uh, going to be a character study where you study the, the individual people the characters, the most prominent characters in the scriptures. And what we've decided to do is just start from the beginning. The first character and then the next one and the next one. But not just not the little minor characters, so the major characters. It'll probably take us a long time to get through them all. It'll be a lot of fun talking about them all. And today we're going to start off with Adam and Eve. Uh, but before we get into that, I'd like the, the uh, panelists here to introduce themselves and uh, Tell the viewing audience uh, the name of your channel, uh, what your channel is about, and, and please, uh, I hope everybody will will uh, subscribe to uh, these panelists. So I'll start with Brother Bill. Yep, hello, thanks, Luke. Yep, and I am the Panda Man Evangelist, and just within the name, you can tell where my my heart and my calling is, and as to evangelize the, the, the glorious gospel of Christ. You know, and, and I like participating. Obviously, in these, in these these hangouts with Brother Luke and, and other people who are like-minded, you know, people who are reasonable, and we can discuss, uh, you know, all manner of biblical topics, you know, with being of one accord. You know, we don't always agree on everything, but for the fundaments, we certainly do. And, and as, you know, I would encourage anyone who, you know, who ever wants to go on Luke's uh, uh, page and to have a look at his core doctrines, if you would agree, you know. I'll speak on my behalf and probably for Luke as well that you're welcome to come join a good Bible study with us. So that, that that's a bit about me and what I you know what I'm here for on YouTube. All right, thank you, Brother Bill. And uh, uh, not only does Bill uh, do a lot of uh, very uh, wonderful things on YouTube, he, he, his his ability to produce a video is. Uh, technically very superior to what what I do. I, I just look into the camera and talk, but when Bill makes a video, it's, it's like a Hollywood production. It's very well done. So uh, his videos are very worthwhile watching, but um, equally important is the time that he spends uh, going right into the streets to, uh, preaching to the public as an open-air preacher. So uh, he's got videos of uh, uh, that ministry also. So I hope you check it out and subscribe to him. Uh, and next we have uh, Brother Dean. Dean, want to introduce yourself? Hey, it's Dean here. Um, my YouTube channel is Virtual Lad Twelve. Um, I just make videos talking about Bible and stuff, stuff like that. And it's a pleasure to be here, as always. I, I, I still have to learn how to, you know, unmute myself before I start talking. It's a uh, um, brother, brother Dean is from Ireland, and he's. Uh, we were talking earlier about the the wonders of the internet, and here we have um, Dean's from Ireland, Bill from England. Uh, I, I, I'm from the United States, Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, we had uh, Sister Joanne on with us last time. I hope she's able to join us later, but uh, she's from Australia. So this allows us all over the world to, to have fellowship and a Bible study. Um, it's just we're, we're just so thankful, even though you know sometimes there are glitches with uh, the internet and, and Google Plus and so on. It, it can be frustrating, but it really is a blessing. So okay, with no further ado, I hope please subscribe to uh, Dean and Bill. And now let's begin the Bible study. Uh, I. I want uh, to uh, things if you feel that I've neglected something, but basically what I did in preparation for this Bible study is simply 
did a search for all the verses that have uh, the name Adam and Eve in them. And uh, so uh, I have them listed there, and I looked through them all to see that, you know, if it was all relevant. And I think there's something to be learned from every one of these verses. So we're going to start with the very, very, very beginning, or read the verse, and then I'd like to get your reaction to it, and then, uh, and then I'll give you my, my viewpoint on it too. We'll start with Genesis 1, 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over uh, every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Uh, let's start at the very beginning of that, the first part. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Uh, Brother Bill, what's your, uh, obviously when it says make man, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm choosing this verse, even though it doesn't have the name Adam and Eve in the verse, it's referring to making Adam and Eve, and it's, uh, it tells us a lot about how God made them, I mean, the, uh, in his image. So, do you want to speak on that? Well, yeah, yeah. It, you know, this, what's so good about that is, it doesn't just stop with image. You know, God, you know, you know, because obviously Moses writ the book of uh, uh, Genesis because God told him exactly what to write in it. And, and it's interesting he wrote it, you know, in our image and likeness. So not only are we like a, some say it this way, it, almost like a carbon copy, Adam and Eve were a carbon copy of God. I, the image, the shape, the form they were in, but also likeness, whereas they had before the fall, and before sin entered the world, they had the likeness and the characteristics of God. You know, there was there was full of love, and and they had a, a great fellowship. So that's what's just fantastic. You know, that 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 when God spoke to Moses and told him to write this account, he wasn't being flippant about it. He didn't say, "Oh well, this happened that." Happened. He went into great detail, so much so that it almost repeats itself later on in Genesis again. In Genesis two, so God really made an effort to make this clear, that we are, as human beings, we are unique. We're not like the other creatures. You know, we are in the image and likeness of, of God himself. You know, that's amazing. Uh, I've, got, uh, I've got some follow-up questions for you about that, Bill, but first I'd like to get Brother Dean's uh, uh, response to that verse. Yeah, I mean, when I really first read this verse, I wasn't too sure about it because it says, and God said, let us make man our image. So he's talking to someone right there, so it bothers me who he's actually talking to. Um, I don't believe Adam and Eve were the first male and female. I mean, God created man in his own image in verse 27, and 28 he says, be fruitful and replenish the earth. He didn't create Adam to Genesis 2, verse 7, so... That's my reaction. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That's something that's probably uh, uh, we normally wouldn't have even uh, thought to discuss. Uh, but I saw you, uh, I don't know if you made a video on it, and, and Bill and you were commenting back and forth. And I, I agree with the Bill's answer to you was, was correct. Uh, but for, let's take one thing at a time. Uh, there's basically... Um, the word our being plural is significant uh, and then what Bill said about making man in, uh, in our image and likeness that's something that we want to learn more about and then there's the question that uh, Dean just brought up were Adam and Eve really the first humans made um, I think that Dean is believing that Adam and Lilith uh, were the first ones uh, because Lilith is a character in extra biblical literature that uh, uh, they claim was uh, made before Eve. But we'll get into more of that now. But let's take one thing at a time. Bill, my question to you about image and likeness, like a carbon copy, you use that term. Um, so when the, when the Bible says that uh, God is spirit, um, do, you, do you think that throughout eternity 
God has existed solely as spirit, or did he eternally have this physicality that, that he, he uh, as, a, as a person, that, that he used to make this carbon copy with Adam? Because um, that's what I'm getting from what you, your, your point was, that you know, we, he made it not only in our image, but likeness, and a carbon copy of him. So did, did God exist in some uh, human-type form that we are created in his image eternally? Yeah, my, my personal take is yeah, yeah. Not obviously there, there. There are so many different variations, you know, just within the few verses of creation. But the, the way I see, you know, to say image and likeness, why did he go to such length? He could have said just like in a likeness, i.e., the characteristics and stuff. But he said image. He put the effort in to say image. So it's as if obviously we're a fallen image. So the carbon copy we see now of mankind. Is full, you know, is fallen, you know, but Adam and Eve, the, 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 their their image before the fall, I believe personally, you know, represents the shape even of God. Yeah, I know his spirit, yeah, and he made man out of the, the dust of the earth. But obviously, I believe he made man in the same shape or form as God, i.e., Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So yeah, it's it's very interesting that that, that 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 like I said, that Moses did say in the image and likeness, you know, as if it was important to do so, distinguish between our shape and physiology and, and that of the, the other creatures that God had created as well. A distinction. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that you emphasizing that point is, is a valid point, and. and why would it say that rather than just say we have the characteristics of God in terms? Uh, but it says it's image and likeness. So I, I think it's safe to conclude that God has eternally had this image and likeness, like we are. Uh, but we, I think we all have to confess that the scriptures tell us an awful lot. There's an awful lot to be learned from the scriptures, but. The scriptures probably tell us like, you know, one tenth of one percent of everything. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's so much that's not in the scriptures that we can ask, and, and this is this is one of the things that uh, we we're surmising it, but it doesn't specifically say God. It, it doesn't say these words. There's no verse that says God has existed eternally uh, as it, with a, a physical body, just like man's. It doesn't say that. But we have to surmise it based upon the, this this verse here. Uh, let me get uh, Dean's reaction to that before we go on to these other two points on this verse. Um, yeah, my reaction is that that is a very interesting point. Um, that's basically it. <laughs> I second what Bo said, really. So. Okay. Um, yeah. Right. There's not a lot that can be said except what we've said on that. So now the question I want to go to is the, the, the fact that the word is plural. It said, let us make man in our image. So we have two words that are plural, us and man. And you also have God speaking. So as, as Dean says, uh, who is he speaking to? So uh, let me get Bill's reaction to this, emphasizing these the use. Uh, in other words, it could, could have very easily God said, "said I will make man in my image," but it says, "Let us make man in our image." So, brother Bill. Yeah, that's significant, you know, because that that to me, yeah, along with other verses, proves that that that, that God isn't just a single entity, i.e. just farmer. So for me, in the plurality of, of where it says create men in our image, we know at least he was talking to someone else. You know, we know it because obviously later on through history it was been revealed to us that God is triune, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But even, even the clue right before he even mentions the word us, you know, where it talks about God creating the heavens and the earth, you know, the word that describes God there, it is Elohim, and that itself is plural. 
So even God himself is pluralized right from the very beginning of, of Genesis. And I think that's, that's marvelous that, you know, what was written in Genesis and revealed obviously later on to us, you know, in the New Testament especially, is consistent that God has always been triune. This is what I believe, always been triune. It has always been a us and not just singular, me, father, and that's it. Yeah, that's a very good point. I'm glad you brought up the Elohim and the plurality of, in that word. Um, but if we if we uh, conclude that this is a God is plural, uh, does that open up the to the uh, the polytheists like Mormonism? See, a Mormon would take that verse and try to justify their uh, uh, polytheism, they, saying that there's oh, let us it's, it, it's this is a council of gods that's having this conversation is how they would interpret it. So you could t say that it's plural, but or you could and, and take it to such an extreme say yeah it's not only plural it means many thousands and millions of gods, uh, uh, or you could use the plurality of it to uh, uh, make the case for the triunity, the Trinity. I, I hold to the Trinitarian viewpoint of the Godhead. Uh, I've, I've studied very carefully modalism. I think this verse here uh, immediately debunks modalism because, I mean, if, if, if in modalism, uh, God, God exists as the Father, and then he will change form and, and operate in a different mode, and now he's operating as the Son, and then he's operating in another mode, he, he's operating as the Holy Spirit. Three different modes of operation, but he doesn't exist simultaneously in, as three distinct persons. That's what modalism is. Uh, and so this verse here is, uh, if, if he was singular, uh, you know, the Father, who is he talking to? It doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, okay, Brother Dean, do you have anything to say about uh, the plurality of the tr Trinitarian viewpoint? Or? Um, yeah, it probably is a Trinity. It's probably, it's probably like the, um, the Father, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and obviously Christ, so it's probably the M2 he's talking to. Um, I wish Sister Joanne was here because she made an interesting video the other day about an egg and trying to illustrate the the Trinitarian uh, uh, viewpoint of the Godhead by you, by illustrating it with an egg. An egg has and it, there's one egg, but it has the the shell is an egg, is egg, the yolk is egg, and the what the the, the white the egg white is is egg. But it's one egg, uh, so that that's not a, a bad example. I don't think that there's any real perfect illustrations of this, but I do think that there's something something to be learned from when it says, "Let us make man in our image." I think that can tell us a lot about this Trinitarian viewpoint. It's, I think it supports it because what is man? Um, I see Brother Bill there, and uh, I, I know that he's one person, uh, and yet there's there's three. We got Bill the body, we got Bill the soul, which is his mind and consciousness, we got Bill the spirit, which is born again and alive, connected to God, and yet there's one Bill, body, my soul, and spirit, but one Bill. And so I think that if the scripture says, let us make men in our image, and if God is triune, he made man triune also. That, uh, I'd like to get your, your reaction to that, Bill. Yeah, spot on. That's exactly what I believe. Absolutely spot on. That, that, that God in his four knowledge and everything else, you know, he said he created man in his image and likeness. Well, we, you know, I believe, you do, and... and you know, that, that, that God is triune. If he created us in his image and likeness and he wasn't triune, you know, we would have been lacking something. 
you know, perhaps we would have been lacking a spirit, we would have been lacking a soul or a body even. You know, God could have created us however he wanted, but I believe because he is trying and he created us in his image and likeness, he created a triune about mankind, which is obviously the physical, the, 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 the soul, which is mind, you know, mind, mind will and emotions, and the spiritual, which is which is the portion that, you know, doesn't die, either goes from one place or another. You know, we are, and that, and that I believe, proves, you know, the, the trinity. Hey, you're muted. You're muted there, Luke. Again. Oh, thank you. Oh man, this is. At least I give myself. I, I just want to say this. This person, is Jeffrey Dunning, is all right. He's, he's all right. He needs to. He needs to probably turn his video or mute his YouTube video. Okay, Je Jeffrey, Je Jeffrey, when uh, you're not speaking, you're not you need to mute that microphone. You know how to mute the microphone at the top of the screen? You left Craig click uh, and the microphone's fumble. Otherwise, we get... Otherwise, we get... <laughs> <laughs> oh. well, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just on top of your screen, you've got a little white icons. Now. You've got a little white icons at the top of your screen. Yeah, okay, on the red, yeah? If you, so if you, if you mention the Google screen at the top, yeah, you've got you've got okay. something that looks like a person, a microphone, a camera. Can you see all that? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so when when someone else talks, we just right. press press the microphone. Can I hear you now? Yeah, that's because I just you? muted. I'll show you an example. Is that muting? Oh yeah, yeah. So. Right, so I left click, yeah? How's that? Yeah? No, 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 I can hear you. You're in, in, the, in the actual hangout room. Right, right. At, the, right at the top, if you move out the hangout screen, you've got, yeah. you've got a little thing where it looks like a person with a plus sign. Right. right. Phone, camera. Can you yeah. see all that? Yeah. If you hover over the microphone, click it, that would mute you. That's okay. It. Yeah, now you're muted. You see the mute sign on the picture below? So what we want to do is, uh, whenever uh, I'm talking, I want to unmute it, and everybody else should be muted. So we have constantly are going to be on mute unless we're speaking. Otherwise, we get that bad feedback. Okay. So let me ask you, uh, Jeffrey, uh, I see the name Jeffrey Dunnage. I'd like to just ask you who you are I, I, and what your YouTube channel is and, and uh, how did you get the invitation to join the, the discussion. Okay, <laughs> can you hear me all right, yeah? Well, I'm a friend of Bill and I haven't really sorted out my YouTube channel properly. I mean, not, not with my own uh, I'm not really a member of any church at the moment. Uh, just, uh, May that great, but I've still got a lot to learn about it. Yeah, so I wouldn't really be a card carrying party member, just yet. And so I get things absolutely sorted. But I will get my YouTube channel set up properly. I want to sort of base it and just get I use mostly Facebook. Okay, so I'll meet the mic now. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you, Brother Jeffrey. Uh, okay. If Brother Bill uh, gave you the invitation, then I, I, I trust that uh, his judgment is good to invite you to join us. Uh, now, uh, I, I don't know if you've been paying attention to what we've discussed so far. We just uh, basically finished discussing uh, this verse, uh, let us make man in our image in Genesis 1, and uh, the, the, the concept of the Trinity. Now we're going to move on to a can of worms that uh, Brother Dean brought up. Um, he is saying when the scripture says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and so on, um, he put uh, forth the idea that uh, uh, 
Adam and Eve. Well, I'll let you. I'll let you explain it, uh, Dean. Uh, if Adam, who were the first humans in your mind? If if it was not Adam and Eve, I wouldn't know who, who the first human human were. But I, what was saying, Jeffrey was um, man was created. Man being female was created in Genesis chapter one. Adam wasn't created in Genesis chapter two, verse seven, and Eve wasn't created to later on that chapter. Well, what, what we were saying as well about the great man in our likeness and our image, I was sort of pointing the question who he was talking to. Um, we came to the conclusion that um, that was the Holy Trinity at the, the time, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. Um, so we agree that when God says, let us make man in our image, God is talking to the Godhead. Maybe it's the Father talking to the Son and the Holy Spirit, or so. Uh, that's the uh, that's the reason that uh, the question is posed in that way. Um, but uh, uh, Brother Dean Brother says, Dean, uh, says, "Yeah, you got to mute that, uh, Jeffrey." Yeah, okay, thank you. Brother Dean says that Adam and Eve were not the first people. I I I, I know that this was discussed in a. Uh, with Bill and you uh, the other day, but uh, do you do you accept Brother Bill's? I guess you don't accept Brother Bill's uh, explanation when he when he answered your question. I'm going to ask Brother Bill to pr make the presentation why uh, you. It seems that to me that you are misunderstanding the, this scripture here about uh, uh, thinking that other people existed before Adam and Eve. Okay, Brother Bill, could you explain it? And I, I do support that viewpoint. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. basically, it yeah, was corresponding. I'm not sure exactly where Dean is at the moment, so he may have changed his mind regarding this, but the, the two theological schools of thought are basically, you know, Genesis 1-1, one, one, you know, expresses creation primarily, you know, in a, a sequential order, all right? Then Genesis 2, all right, it goes into more detail. So it's the same account. So Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are the same account, one sequentially and one in a bit more detail. All right? And obviously the, the, the second uh, school of thought is obviously, which, which some people do, is that, that, that there was like almost, when Adam was created, it was with Lilith. And then obviously things got messed up there and it's as if God had to recreate the woman again out of the man himself. So you know there's there's the two schools of thought. I, I obviously believe the first school of thought because to get to the second school of thought you have to literally you have to go from, you know through the Talmud and you have to go through certain Gnostic writings or extra biblical material to conclude that. You know that that is basically it really. I'm not sure where Dean is at the moment because you know, we we, 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 we we were still discussing that. Okay, so um, I, that's the way that I've uh, understood it also, Bill, is that uh, you have two accounts of, cre of creation there. Um, and some people say, well, what was there, a creation, then a recreation or something going on? Or is it, it's, it seems to tell there about a creation, then another creation. Uh, so a lot of people have gotten confused over that, but I, I think the consensus opinion the theology is that what you just said there. The first account is a, um, uh, a broad overview uh, story, and then it's in other words, let's, I, I tell you a story in, in, a, in a broad way, and then I say, now let me go into more detail and tell you exactly how all that happened. And so that's... Uh, that sh hopefully uh, that'll make sense to you, but uh, that's how uh, most people don't believe that there were two creations and do not believe this uh, fact. The idea that see when you if you take Lilith, I mean I don't know if you're even familiar with that character, but uh, it's not a Bible character. Uh, it's from one of these uh, Gnostic books that are extra biblical, and uh, those books are not in the Bible because uh, uh, they didn't meet the standard. Either the, the authorship was questioned, or the theology was questioned, and therefore didn't qualify to go in the canon. So when you read the extra biblical 
books, sometimes you can learn something from them, but I wouldn't, don't call them scripture and don't put that much faith in, in what they say. Um, all right, uh, let, Dean, you can say the final word on that, and then we'll move on to this next verse. Um, yeah, I was familiar with the character Lilith. I think that was, I knew I was like a Jewish myth or something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, there's Cain and his wife. Where did his wife come from, really? And then there's Cain, he got he got marked because he wanted to protect him from being killed by people. So who were these people that were wanting, were wanting to kill him? Well, were hunters even? Uh, th those are good questions. I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, 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 Brother Jeffrey, do you want to comment on anything except at this point? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm a bit mixed up actually as, as I've only come in sort of halfway to this, but I've been I've been studying this about verses. Uh, I've learned a lot from Joe Charles. He's, he's a, a, a creation is that Satan had already fallen and so the, there had been an issue of creation before this one. So the world is actually being recreated. The, the, um, the people that were after Cain, the ones that wanted to kill him, I think it's pretty obvious that I mean, he wasn't the first people. There was, they must have had other children you know, before that. Maybe there wasn't. I mean, for example, uh, with Cain and Abel, when God cursed the ground, he said to the woman, I shall greatly increase your pains in childbirth. So obviously, she's already been through it. So they weren't the first two children. Okay, I hope I'm, I hope I'm keeping up with this. Yeah? All right, I'll mute my mic again. You know, if you want to. Okay, um, obviously uh, Dean, uh, he's uh, he's just a real troublemaker. I mean, this he he likes to stir things up and ask these controversial questions. And, <laughs> but actually, it's good because it gives us a chance to uh, ponder these questions that, that a lot of people have wondered about, and uh, a lot of people have taken a lot of time to study this through and, and come up with an answer. We're supposed to be ready with an answer, uh, Brother Bill. How is it possible that uh, when uh, uh, Cain was cast out, that uh, there was already a population of people for him to join? Well, this is personal, obviously, because the Bible itself is, as we know, Bible basic instructions before leaving Earth. So it doesn't go into every single detail. My personal view is that, you know, Adam and Eve lived 900 odd years. And, it, and obviously, I'm sure you could, you know, this was before, you know, things all went bad and, we, you know, we, we could only live, you know, 120 years, etc. I'm pretty sure that the gene pool was very strong then. And Adam and Eve, you know, had lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of children. And because obviously the gene pool was, was pure in that sense, it wasn't deteriorated over, long, over time. That obviously these people knew each other, if you know what I mean, and created more people, which created more people. So in 900 odd years, you could have quite a, a large population in which you know that the, 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 the world was pretty getting pretty populated. And, and I know it doesn't mention it; you know, it just mentions the, the, the significant characters. You know, we even find that oftentimes in the Bible, you know, we, we hear of uh, Solomon and all his wives, but you don't hear all the names of his wives. So that you know, the the, the, the person you know who was writing, you know, obviously these accounts picked on the significant characters and the significant points. You know, we're not belittling Solomon's wives here, but they don't name all thousand wives. They name, you know, just name significant ones. And perhaps it's the same scenario within the Genesis account that it names obviously the significant characters, i.e., Adam, Eve, then obviously Cain, Abel, and Seth, 
but didn't, you know, name all their other children that, that, that may have populated the earth. This, this is what I believe personally, you know, you know, and that's, and that, that, that's, that's how, how I see it. But I've also heard the arguments the other side as well, of, of obviously the gap here and the pre-creation and all sorts of things, but, you know, this, this is where I personally come from. Yeah. Okay. Well done, brother. Uh, th that to me is the is the correct answer. Uh, and uh, as you said, uh, um, we we have to try to figure out how this could have happened uh, 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 and make it make sense. Otherwise, we have to uh, say that hey, the the, uh, the the fall of man, Adam and Eve, uh, being the um, First cre created, uh, and, and then their fall. That all unravels too, if there was already a, another population of people, if they were not the first and fell, because obviously the other people, um, they had, uh, they were not sinless. They must have, they must have had sin. That would bring sin in before the fall. So uh, you you have to make rational sense out of it. Otherwise, you have to throw out the whole thing because because uh, uh, the idea of the fall of man uh, you know falls apart. And I think Brother Bill's explanation is the sensible one. Uh, we don't know uh, at what age uh, Cain was cast out. I mean, you know, he might have been 400 years old at that point. I don't know. I don't know. How but uh, that, there's our answer. It's the best we can do, and uh, uh, I'm going to have to stick with the idea, even though sometimes we have an answer, and it may not be uh, a real convincing answer, a real foolproof answer. Uh, it's it's the only one that uh, makes sense, so that everything else still holds true. Otherwise, uh, we just have to just say, hey, the uh, the like the Pope said, the, this this Pope we've got now, Francis. He, he says just this whole account in Genesis is just like a fairy tale. So I'm not prepared to do that. I believe I take it literally. And uh, but if we if we think that there were other people who were around before Adam and Eve, then we have to say either the whole account of the fall of man and, and sin entering the world and death through sin entering the world that wouldn't all make sense. It's the same thing with believing in. Uh, 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 evolution of man. Instead of if a person doesn't believe that man was created intact as as a finished product, as a as a person, if he, they think that we evolved from lower species, then that also destroys the whole idea of death entering the world. Uh, so, um, if we're going to be consistent, we have to accept the answers that Bill gave, even though. You may not say, "Well, that doesn't sound like a perfect answer." It, uh, it, we have to have something that will still make everything else fit together properly. Otherwise, uh, you know, let's throw the Bible away. All right. Anybody else want to say anything about that before we move to another verse? Okay, I'll go um, on now. Yeah. Right. Am I on? Yeah. Okay. Are we going to get to the Nephilim? I think that's a Pretty good subject. No, uh, I've got in the uh, in the description side. Do you, do you know how to see the uh, comment, the chat side of the of the uh, page here? If you look at that, I've got the verses we're going to go through. What we're doing is we're discussing all the verses that pertain to Adam and Eve, and we're going in in, in uh, order. And uh, the Nephilim, uh, if we ever get to them, it'll be months down the road. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Clear on that. Yeah. Can, right. can, I just want to say, can you see the chat chat section, uh, Jeff? You're muted. Yeah. Because Jeff is this is Jeff's first ever hangout, and he's new to this. I'm not sure if he knows where how to get to the chat section. Can you can you point out so show yeah. where to point and yeah, basically Jeff. Jeff yeah. On the left, have you got the chat section up, Jeff? Yeah. Okay. Then. Okay. Then.
Okay. Uh, all right. If we're ready to move on, I'm going to move on now to uh, Genesis 2, uh, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Uh, Brother Bill, we'll give you first shot at that verse. Yep, yep, it was literally, this is, I, I did post something on here earlier because I've obviously done a little bit of homework, but even the word Adam, all right, means, obviously we know it means humankind or mankind, but it also means, which was interesting, uh, the colour red, all right, and, and, and behind the, the root word of that, the colour red, it describes the, the, the colour of the soil in which God created man from which is interesting. So even the word Adam itself has got significance in that he was created from a red soil, you know, which obviously, you know, in, the, in Eden, that must have been, you know, so. It's very interesting. Uh, yeah, that is an interesting point. Uh, and it makes you wonder about the actual appearance of Adam and Eve. Uh, uh, because if you look at me, I, I'm quite pale. And then, uh, of course, the, the complexion, the pigmentation of people around the world varies greatly. I'm wondering if, if Adam was a darker pigmentation originally. Uh, that might be important to some people. I don't know. I'm, I, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, a lot of people argue about what Jesus looked like. Some people, it's, it's very important that he was darker because he's always portrayed in, a, uh, in the movies as uh, you know, you know, light light brown hair and blue eyes, and of course, coming from the Middle East, uh, you know that's not a, a very common trait. Usually, it's dark eyes and dark hair, darker skin, and so uh, some people make a big deal about that. And it's very important to them. Uh, to me, if whatever complexion or hair color Jesus had is irrelevant to me. I don't love him any more or less based upon that. And now we have the same question here about Adam. Uh, so let's talk about that, and then uh, any more, anything else you want to say about this first verse here, this, this point I made. Um, uh, For man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Okay, Brother Dean? Um, I have nothing really to say out there, right? This one. Both sides, I agree, and I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement with him. Just all right. Yeah. Let's see. Mm. Okay, uh, brother, brother Jeffrey, do you want to say anything about that verse? Yeah, I'll just say that uh, he didn't say that about any of the animals. I think that's the big difference between us and them. The the argument that animals have got souls that uh, God didn't actually he only breathed into Adam, man, not them. That's, that's all I know on that one. Uh, I've got the cat on my lap as well. I think he's offended. <laughs> okay. Uh... All right. Um, I think that this uh, it is very significant when it says, uh, "Form man from the dust of the ground." Well, you know, there's a is there a verse in the scripture that says uh, like ashes to ashes, dust to dust, or something? I know that that's something in uh, people say at funerals. I can't recall if there's a scripture that says. Uh, like we re, re, re return and become dirt again. Yeah, there is, yeah, from dust they lap and from dust shall they return. Okay. Uh, so uh, that is significant that we are made out of dirt, earth, uh, and then uh, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now, what do you think that this breath of life that makes and that makes man become a living soul. Brother Bill? Well, to me, that is clear. I, I, I believe that. And, and if, I think if you look, trace the Hebrew, that, that, that is the Holy Ghost. You know, before the fall, 
that that every you know man and woman ha had the breath of life. That, that in the Hebrew uh, pronounced it as the, as the Ruach Hakadosh. It was the Holy Ghost was was breathed. The breath of God was breathed into mankind that day, and that 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 is very significant. You know, especially as we go on, you know, throughout the Bible, how we fell. And and and, and well, it was calamity and disasters after that. But initially, man was created perfect in the image of the of God, and the Holy Ghost was in uh, you know in Adam. You know, it was the ruach hakadosh was breathed straight in Adam, and that and that is the life. You know, for the New Testament, it is the eternal life, the new life. But even when the Old Testament was in creation, it was life in itself. But it's very significant, I believe. Okay, yeah, well said. Uh, let's uh, introduce uh, Brother Jackson. Brother Jackson, wow, it's, it, I'm really nice to, nice to see you. I'm glad you, uh, you surprised me. I haven't talked to you for quite a while. Welcome to the discussion. Well, thank you very much, Brother Luke. It's been quite a while because I've been, had a lot of things come up in my life and everything. And I've been over winter break. I was dealing with my parents a lot, and the semester is just starting up again. So finally, I'm back to Fort Collins by myself. And um, I just saw the invite for the hangout, and I finally kind of recovered enough to start doing this again, at least sometimes. And I, I did get back from a church today. I visited a church called Fort Collins Bible Church, where I talked to the pastor and I noticed they had some you know that that really great gospel booklet that I have a video about and everything they had those on the table so I had a conversation with the pastor and it seems like there's a lot of a uh, lot of commonality in terms of the freeness of salvation at this church as tiny as it is so well I'll tell you what uh, if that church had that booklet on the table for the public to take uh, that's all you need to know about that church is, is yeah. sal salvation. I mean, if if that's what they're putting out as yeah. as uh, they want the people to know about salvation, then yeah. you should feel so comfortable. I mean, you should be like yeah. you know, like you just we're gonna do a warm bath water. And you're so comfortable. Exactly. And you know what? I I found out that this guy, uh, the pastor who I talked to briefly. Uh, went to the Duluth Bible Church conference, and he said that their theology is in line with Duluth Bible Church. So, excellent. Well, I'm real happy for you because it's so it's so hard. I think we we've all had experiences. It's very difficult to find a local congregation that, that, that you're, you're really comfortable in uh, that is sound uh, on these core doctrines. Uh, so, congratulations, brother. And now. Have you been paying attention all? Do you have any idea what we're talking about today? All I saw is that the name of the hangout was Adam and Eve. I don't know if we're doing some kind of creation science thing or whatever. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we've uh, Brother Dean here, he keeps on stirring up trouble here, asking us to talk about things that are real controversial. But So it's been pretty interesting. I, I wish you were here a little earlier to get your feedback on a couple of his questions. So, a matter of fact, I'll give you a chance to do that. Uh, Excellent. Uh, we're talking about uh, the, the – we're moving from uh, topical studies uh, to character studies. And the first characters we're taking on are Adam and Eve. And uh, so all I've got is I've got all the verses that pertain to Adam and Eve, and we're going through them in, in, in order. And, of course, the first thing that came up was the idea of let us make man in our image. And so that led us to the Trinitarian viewpoint. But Brother Dean, uh, he, he, he thinks that uh, he brought up the idea that, well, where did Cain go? And where, was, where did all these people come from? That uh, when Cain was cast out, there was a population of people. And he's putting forth that maybe there were people um, before Adam and Eve. And I said, well, that would ruin the entire idea of the fall of man. And, and uh, our whole concept of uh, the fall of man and salvation falls apart if that's the case. But first answer, give me your reaction to that before I tell you what else we've been covering. Well, as far as Adam being the first man, I'm getting feedback on somebody's uh, speakers. But as far as the first man... As far as the first man is concerned, yeah, thank you. Now I can. I don't have the feedback. I believe there's a verse. Hold on. Let me. Let me quickly. Let me quickly. It may not be the 
the first. Um, but but my initial reaction, without having time to process, one of the reasons I don't make more videos than I do is because I really feel like I want to process things before before I answer them. But one of my initial reactions to maybe the problem is human genetics may have been a lot tougher, uh, better, and and more, uh, more and and, and People could have been more prolific, in other words, when he said be fruitful and multiply. Like if you look at that family, the Duggars, that has the um, that that had they have like 19 children or whatever. That's even in this day and age. If there was if if back in the time when before all these flaws in genetics, maybe Eve could have had more than that. I don't know, but that's just a thought off the top of my head. I do think it's an interesting question and point. Let me try to find that verse. That I think would be difficult to answer for someone who didn't believe that Adam was the first human. Okay, uh, expanding on that a little further, I'll ask you uh, uh, the, the the topic of was brought up and uh, uh, being there before Eve, and, and because the the there's two accounts of creation, the first account. Uh, and, and then another account afterwards. So some people think that there's two creations, and that maybe Lilith was made. And and but uh, I, I, brother Bill and I answered the question about why there's two accounts of creation, uh, and why we should not put any faith in Lilith being just in, in extra biblical writings. But if you could talk about that for a second, and then you'll be pretty much caught up with us. Well, do, do you mean do you mean the two cr accounts of creation being Genesis one and Genesis two, or are you talking about in the Psalms when they when Adam does go over the creation? Or, sorry, not Adam. David goes over the creation. No, uh, Genesis one and two. And the question, if I understand it correctly, is why are there two of them? Okay. Yes. Yes. So. Um, you know, whenever this is another again another thought off the top of my head, I I like to put much more thought, as you know, Luke, into things before I take a dogmatic stance of any kind. But you know, if you if you heard some heard my perspective on something, and you also heard somebody else's perspective who was there, um. You'd probably have two different accounts, even if they didn't contradict each other, because they were from two different perspectives of what was happening and what was going on. And I know it's the same author, Moses, but he might have been kind of giving two two uh, uh, two points of view in terms of what the creation looked like. Maybe Genesis one from God's perspective, and God created this, God created that, and maybe Genesis two is more like what you could observe if you had been there to see what it would have looked like. That's my initial thought. Okay. Uh, well, the, the the general answer to the question, Bill did uh, answer, and I, I, I agree with it, is that uh, the first account is a, is a broad general account, and it's like I tell you, um, this is uh, generally what happened, and now I tell you again, I say, now let me go into more detail and tell you the specifics. So it's right. the same account, it's just it's just going into more detail the second time. Uh, that's what Bill and I think, and it's a pretty consensus opinion in, in uh, theology study. But the other, yeah, yeah. the other question is this idea of Lilith uh, and extra-biblical, because she's not in the scriptures. So how much confidence should be put in in uh, in the stories about Lilith? Um, you know, to be honest with you, I'm not very familiar with the stories of Lilith. I mean, I think I can gather from the context what they are at least. But I I I think it's possible that there's you know historic historical things there because it's true that the the history of our country. Is not um, is not it's in the Bible, and yet we believe in George Washington and whatnot, and Abraham Lincoln. But but the thing is, we do know that historical writers and people writing history may have made some errors, and that that um, we don't take everything that historians write as 100% accurate all the time. And my hunch would be that'd be a good historic good principle with Lilith. Okay. All right. 
Well, I'm going to move on. Thank you for now. You're kind of caught up, uh, everybody. Uh, uh, if you didn't don't know, this is Brother Jackson. His channel is called Mecha Wing Zero. He has a second channel called Osas Arminian. So please, everybody, subscribe to him. It'll be very worthwhile. Uh, and now uh, I'll move on. And we're talking about uh, God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. A couple of interesting things were uh, brought up there, being made from the dust of the earth, and then when we die, we return and become the dust of the earth again. Uh, and, and breathe, But uh, Brother Bill brought up the idea that the name Adam has several meanings, one of them meaning red. And so people think that uh, if Adam was made out of red earth, that uh, I'm questioning, well, what kind of complexion do we surmise that he may have had because a lot of people are offended that uh, in movies Jesus is depicted as a Caucasian with with blue eyes whereas we know that in the Middle East they have dark eyes and dark hair dark skin and I'm, I'm putting forth the same question about Adam uh, to me uh, it's irrelevant but I know that there are some people where this uh, racial type of question is very important to them and, and, and uh, for their sake, let's, let's, let's talk about that for a moment. And then also the question of what does it mean uh, breathe into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul? Uh, we'll, we'll start with Brother Jackson and we'll go back to the others for a review. Well, what, when it comes to the racial question, there's really no way to know for sure, at least. Um, when it comes to whether he was made out of what what it means when he was made out of the dust and and life was breathed into his nostrils, uh, I personally take that literally. I think that God literally made man from the dust. I don't believe in a in a sort of theistic evolution explanation where really that means that the 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 cell that we all came have common ancestry with that that was in the dust or something. No, I I think he really did take the earth and form it into man there, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, it does. And that brings us back to a question Bill brought up in the very beginning. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. The question was, uh, was Adam, um, uh, if he was made in God's image and likeness, did God eternally have that image and likeness? Or did God has God exist eternally merely as a spirit? Um, I, I think that, that, rephrase the question a little bit, I'm a little bit confused. You're muted still, so. <laughs> Thanks. There we we go. know God is, we know God is eternal, and we know that it says that, uh, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. We talked about the Trinitarian um, viewpoint of the, the word our, and also pre, the, prior to that, the word Elohim is plural. So we talked about the Trinity, uh, but uh, the question is, if God is eternal and man is made in his likeness and image, does God, has God eternally had this image and likeness like man? I would say yes. Would say yes. Yeah. Okay, so you're caught up, but uh, I want to expound on what Brother Bill said about the Spirit, breathing in the Holy Spirit. Um, I remember that Jesus, uh, he gave the apostles the Holy Spirit bef before the uh, death, burial, and resurrection, and now now we have the uh, the baptism, indwelling, and sealing of the Holy Spirit permanently in us. Um, before that, uh, God would put his spirit in people temporarily to give them power to, to do something. Uh, and bre Jesus breathed into the, uh, the face of the apostles. Uh, at some point, maybe someone can tell me the chapter and verse where that is, and they received the Spirit. And I think this is the same kind of thing here. God breathed into Adam, and he became a, uh, uh, got the breath of life, became a living soul. So this breath of God, uh, Bill says, that's the Holy Spirit. And I, 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 I agree with that. So let me ask uh, Brother Dean if he wants to say anything about that. 
Um, yeah, I basically agree with Bill says. I've been honest with you. Can't really think of anything else to say to add to that either. Okay. Uh, Jeffrey, do you want to say something about that verse? Or do you think that this breath of life was the uh, the Holy Spirit that uh, God put into Adam? Yeah, yeah, I do. I don't, I don't know too much of the subject, but uh, I'm gonna have to go off for a little while. Yeah, and maybe I'll maybe about later. All right, I'm going to okay. later. All right. Okay. So, uh, Jackson, what is your what is your uh, reaction to that? Is this he breathed into him the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Uh, Bill and I are saying that this breath of life means that he uh, received the Holy Spirit. Uh, do, you, do you see any reason why that would not be valid, uh, Jackson? Well, the, the only reason I would, I would think that it might not be valid, um, and I'm not even positive, is the fact that it seems like in the Old Testament the Holy Spirit comes and goes. It says in Psalms somewhere, it says, take not your Holy Spirit from me, whereas in the New Testament, believers are sealed with it, and it never leaves us. And um, I don't know if the Holy Spirit is equivalent to life, if that makes sense, in this case. Okay. Uh, let me ask Bill to comment on this now. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, Jackson's right, you know, but with it in the Old Testament, you know, it, the Holy Spirit w was passed upon person to person. I, so so it's, it was taken from King Saul and then passed on to, to King David. We know that uh, for a fact because it's written in, in the scriptures. Uh, and my, like my personal intake is, you know, the Holy Spirit was breathed into Adam and he became a living soul. I, life was in him to the fullness. You know, obviously it was marred by by uh, the fall, etc. But initially, the Holy Ghost, you know, was in and was in Adam, in Adam and Eve, you see. And I, you know, because of the fall, you know, obviously things changed. They did die, but we've got to also remember that 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 although the Holy Spirit was only on one person at a time, or, or a significant person at a time in the Old Testament. It, it doesn't mean to say that, that, that they were eternally lost because we know that Christ, you know, after he was crucified, he went into the belly of the earth and Peter describes that he even preached, didn't he? You know, some say he preached in Abraham's bosom. So all the people who died before Christ at least got a chance to, to receive Christ again. And perhaps, you know, this is extra biblical, we don't know because it's not recorded. To, to, to give him this gospel when he was in the belly of the earth and, and so they could receive the, the, the Holy Ghost permanently as all people after, you know, after Christ rose again and Pentecost came could receive the Holy Ghost, you know, you know, eternally, you know, then. You know, so there's a lot of interest, a lot of interest and very deep, you know, thoughts in regard just to that. <clears throat> Well, I'll tell you, my, uh, I've uh, talked about this a lot of times on other videos, and, and I think that the, uh, uh, the this um, idea of God, God bringing Adam to life and then the fall of man, uh, we know that at the fall, man died. But we know that Adam lived for 900 years more. So we know that this death was not a physical death, it was a spiritual death. The scriptures say that, that we're spiritually dead and need to be born again. So uh, the way I interpret all that is that when God breathed into Adam the, this uh, uh, spirit of life, breath of life, it, it is the Holy Spirit, and, he, and, and Adam was uh, spiritually connected to God through the, the Holy Spirit living in him. And uh, so Adam had a spirit, and the Holy Spirit were like this, united, and, and then at the fall, it was severed. And now he's left with a spirit that's dead because it's no longer connected to God. Uh, and then we need to get born again so the Holy Spirit re regenerates us and brings us back to life spiritually. Uh, so uh, to me, that's why I think that uh, it... Uh, 
it's the case where when he first brought Adam to life, it's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's just the, 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 that did it. The Spirit of God brought him to life. Uh, okay, Jackson, uh, before we go on, do uh, you have anything to say about that? No, I think you've you answered that question pretty well. So, All right. Uh, Dean, you're not muted. Do you want to say something? Sorry, what, what, what was this question again, sir? I got out there. Uh, I can't repeat the question again. It was a long essay, I, I, I said. Do you either agree with it or you don't? So I'll have to move on. <laughs> okay. uh, just, before you move yeah. on, I just wanted to just quote the passage just to, to back up what we were saying earlier. That was in John chapter 20, verse 22. And it says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So this was obviously... God gave the Holy Ghost, obviously through Christ, to, to the apostles before Pentecost. And, that, and that's John 20, verse 22. Okay. Uh, well, you know, in these, in these uh, Bible studies, uh, uh, I want to be, I want us to be free to really get into a subject, even though you may think, well, this is not as relevant, let's move on. But when you bring up the subject of, the Holy Spirit uh, in people, um, I, I think it's important to clarify uh, these different ways the Holy Spirit is in people, because you've got you've got the term uh, uh, baptized in the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, indwelled with the Spirit, and sealed with the Spirit. I, I have a, a definition for each of those terms. Uh, they're not identical and so uh, I would ask let's 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 discuss those terms because what you're referring to in before the the resurrection when Jesus breathed into the to them and they received the Holy Spirit uh, that's something different than what happened when I was born again uh, in, in uh, December of uh, 1986 uh, so uh, I'd like you to someone, whoever wants to dare to do it, take on the terms uh, sealed with the Spirit, indwelled with the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, and uh, what's the other one? Uh, uh, baptized with the Spirit. Who wants to try that? <laughs> you really, really opened the kind of words there now. When you look. <laughs> oh dear. I, I... I'd love to. I'll, I'll tell you what the problem with tackling that question is. That would lead into a whole new subject that will last about three hours. But mm -hmm. I would say you, you you are correct in the sense that that they have different connotations. Yeah. Baptizing, baptizing of the Holy Spirit it is something that happens. You know, as soon as we believe on Christ, and you know we we are placed into the body of Christ, breathed into the Spirit. Perhaps, as you say, it was the initial breathing of the Spirit Adam and Eve received that gave them life initially. And with the apostles, it, it is perhaps a, a, an extra or a supernatural breathing upon that, that, that gave them you know, the abilities that, that only the apostles had. But yeah, a very deep subject you've opened there. Yeah, I'm afraid we'll have to make up. If we were talking about this, we we'll might start making videos against each other, Bill. Uh, ja Jackson, you're a little far away and, and you're faint right now, I think. We could hardly hear you at that time. Well, can you hear me better now? Let's see. Can I be heard right now? Yeah, you was right just then. Okay, good, good. Yeah, I just have to be a little bit closer. I was just facetiously saying to Bill, I'm afraid that if we talk about that too much, like you said, we're going to have to start making dogmatic videos against each other and everything. And everyone's <laughs> yeah. going to have to divide. And <laughs> exactly, yeah. This is yeah. One, it's a very deep subject. Well, indeed. Let me uh, let me uh, define them as I understand them, and, and I, I don't see the controversy really. I'm, I'm not expecting us to have a great disagreement on this, but I will I will define them as I see it, and see if you guys have any disagreement with this. As Brother Bill said, when we put our faith in Jesus initially. We are that's uh, we are born again. That's the baptism of the spirit. Now the Pentecostals think the baptism of the spirit is some 
uh, thing that happens that you you speak in tongues and and you uh, you have some miraculous sign that's the baptism of the spirit, but that's wrong. Baptism in the spirit simply means every Christian that first puts their faith in Jesus, that's the spiritual baptism instead of the water baptism. The next is the indwelling of the spirit, and that just means that once the spirit comes in us, it it it, it lives in us. It it's not like uh, when he put it, gave the apostles the spirit, or in the Old Testament where a prophet got the spirit. No, he's actually the spirit remains and lives in us. And then the fi this, there's the sealing of the spirit. That means not only lives in us, it's sealed airtight, and the spirit will never leave us. We're eternally secure until the day of redemption. Then the other one, of course, is the filling of the spirit or the breathing of the spirit, like we had with the Old Testament prophets like we had with Jesus with the apostles breathing on them and like we have right now before we before we start this show normally we pray and we say Lord fill us with the Holy Spirit give us the power to, to use to, to, to uh, work through us in their ministry so I think the filling of the Spirit is just the spiritual power that God gives us to, to accomplish something that's how I would define those terms. Now, if, if you think I'm wrong on any of those, I'm open to, to hear it. They sound pretty, pretty good to me. Obviously, we, we know that, and, and this is what I said, it's slightly different, because obviously uh, in John 20, 22, it does seem that, that Christ breathed on them, the Holy Spirit. Yeah, they were saved already, but it seems as if they did receive by breath. This is to me. I, I, I'm not. You know, we haven't really studied or gone into any exegesis or exegesis in regard to this. But it seems as it was. It was like the unction. They they had a special anointing because they had a special task. You know, because there's lots of things the apostles did. You know, did do in the apostolic age that we don't do now. You know, we can pretend that we're, we're living in the apostolic age, and many do. Many Pentecostals and Charismaniacs do. But the fact of the matter is, you know, we can't, as Christians now, do what the apostles done. We can't go into our local leukemia ward and bring back, you know, all the dead people in that ward or, or, or cure everyone of cancer. So, you know, these, these were special, significant gifts that I believe were by unction and breathed on the apostles. You know, this is my viewpoint. You know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, being dogmatic and saying, "Thus saith the Lord," but you know, this is how I distinguish between these these two things. Yeah, uh, I'd say that uh, uh, everything before Pentecost was this: the Spirit would work temporarily through people, and after Pentecost, we we receive the the the, the Spirit permanently. Now, even though the Holy Spirit lives in us, is sealed in us, we can still pray for more power from God. That's the filling of the Spirit to give us power to to uh, to preach or to do some uh, ministry. Uh, that uh, before we go on, Jackson or, or Dean, you want to comment on that? I agree with Bill. I, I think pretty much everything Bill said there, um, I agree with. Okay, did Bill say something different than I did? Because I didn't see any distinction between what Bill said and I did. I don't think it's that he said something different necessarily. It's just that Bill was real clear that he believed in the cessation of certain gifts. In the cessation? Oh, yeah. Well, the, what, what I say that we receive uh, the filling of the Holy Spirit now, I'm not talking about the spiritual gifts. I believe in the right. cessation of the gifts also. But, but the... The, the gifts of speaking in tongues and all the, the things that uh, you're, ta you're referring to um, have nothing to do with what I'm saying. When you pray, uh, before I would go preach, I'd pray, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit so that the Spirit can work through me, give me power. Right. Uh, that is not, that's totally different than uh, you know, the gifts of the Spirit that, that have ceased that you're, you're referencing. Okay? All right, I guess we beat that one to death, so let's go on. Uh, uh, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. 
the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All right, this is one of my favorite parts of the whole Bible here, this, this, these verses here. So I'd like to uh, say anything you like on, on that, and we'll, we'll start with Brother Bill. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, just going to ask, can you, can you pose that question one more time so it's clear within my head? You're muted at the moment, Luke. Okay. I just read Genesis 2, verse 9. If you find that right there, I'd like you to comment on that verse. Okay, I'm just going to read from yourself. Yeah, and out of the ground, is that, is that right? And out of the ground, yeah. yes, yes. made the Lord to grow every tree that is pleasant in the sight and of good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Yeah, that is, this is, yeah, this is very deep. It's as if, yeah. So you had the tree of life that you could. They could, I believe, this is what, how I see it, that they could eat of and they would live. But obviously they had the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which they were told not to eat of. And obviously the moment, you know, God even pre-warned them, the moment you eat that, you know, that, 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 that's death. But, you know, are you trying to, are you trying to point us in the direction of why he planted the, the tree of good and knowledge in the first place in the garden, as if it was like uh, something to, to, to test their obedience, perhaps? Well, it, it, was, it, it was not my intention, but that's okay if you want to go in that direction, if you want to discuss that. But uh, um, uh, I think that there's a lot to be said about these two particular trees, the meaning of the trees, the significance of the trees, and uh, I've learned a lot about it just the last couple of years that I didn't understand before, and I've found out there's a lot of people recently that are teaching on this that are in agreement. So I, I, I have some things to say if you guys don't say it first, but I'll give you the first opportunity. Uh, Brother Dean, you were going to talk? Yeah, I was actually going to ask, I was going to say what Bill said. Why would he plant the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden if he's, you know, if it brings death and stuff like that. That's what I was going to ask. Oh, man, this is a brother Dean, man. He's just always stirring up trouble, isn't he? Yeah, Dean, you're a troublemaker. Man, he's just asking all these controversial questions, and, man, uh, it's a good thing we have a great brotherhood here because, uh, you know, even if we don't agree with these answers here, no one's going to get mad at each other. So thank God for that. Um, Brother Jackson, I'll give you first stab at that. The question is, uh, I, I wanted to know more about what the meaning of these trees are, but Brother Dean and Brother Bill, they brought up the question, well, why would he even put them there? What, what is it? What's the point? Brother Jackson? Well, personally, I think the main point is free will. Is It's very important for God that we're choosing to obey him or choosing to uh, believe on him in case of salvation or choosing to do things his way rather than us being programmed robots. Not that we'd be robots if the tree wasn't there, but then we wouldn't have the option of disobedience. It's kind of like the concept of if you love if you love someone and and but they don't have the ability to say no to marrying you or something that might uh, that that might not be as meaningful as if they could have said no but they said yes to a lot of people if that makes sense yeah to me that that is the correct answer uh, it, it boils down to free will and, um, you know, we did a lot of teaching on Calvinism against that. And the, the main problem with Calvinism is this, uh, that uh, man is just a robot that God controls. And, and, of course, we don't agree with Calvinism. We believe man is, has free will, and we're responsible for our decisions. If we didn't have a free will and God controlled everything we did, then, uh, you know, God couldn't hold us responsible. He would be the guilty party because he's the one that's controlling us. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we are not Calvinists, and we, 
we believe in free will, and why did God need to give us free will? Well, Brother Jackson pointed out, it's because that's the only way true love can, can happen. You have to have a, a free will in order to have real love. And, and uh, Scripture says God is love, and that gets us back to the Trinity again. So I'll ask Brother Bill to talk about that, uh, this concept, free will, love, the Trinity, and this, the reason for the, the, the tree of knowledge and the, of good and evil and the tree of life. Brother Bill? Yeah, a lot of questions there. <laughs> but simply that, that God did create us in love, and, and we are his ultimate creation, i.e. In, in the image of likeness of himself. And I suppose, you know, the, the, the free will test was put there right at the beginning. I suppose, you know, are, are we going to choose to, to to freely love God and just, just you know, do what pleases him, or are we going to freely choose to displease him? Obviously, the, the answer is, and because of the fall, you know, we chose to, to freely disobey him, which in itself, as you say, it totally debunks Calvinism straight on, on the offer, straight from the beginning. You know, it destroys Calvinism completely. But there, there is a significant point. I don't know, this might take us off a little bit, slightly off subject, but off subject. But there, there is some a real good point that I noticed, you know, throughout reading you know, the accounts in Genesis and obviously the the, the, the taking of the fruit of, of tree of knowledge. Did you did you want to allow me to expound on that? Is that okay with you? Just for a minute, Luke. You you muted, Luke. Luke, you're muted still. Uh. Uh, I'd, like for us to, I'd like for us to finish the discussion on free will and love uh, before we move on to the other thing. Yeah, the, okay. The point, yeah, because it's, it's the point, what we're talking about, it does tie in a free will as well, and it debunks Calvinism at the same time, but it will, it will just take me a couple of minutes. Okay, go ahead, brother. That's okay. And, and the point I want, wanted to make in is... Within the account in Genesis chapter two and three, that you you hear if you read carefully, the first ever example of, of lordship salvation. All right, this is quite important because not only does it debunk Calvinism, it also shows what happens when when you try and add to what God has said. All right, so I'm, I'm just going to quickly read, just briefly. I'm going to read. Genesis 2, 16 and 17, right? And it says, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So that's in, that's in obviously, Genesis 2, 17. Okay, that, so that was God's command. You know, free will there. You either choose to eat it or don't. But if you eat it, you will die. That's the command that God set forth. When we get to Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 and 3, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than the beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, have God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, now this is important, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. That's important because God gave a command not to eat it, then all of a sudden, somewhere there was a correspondence between Adam and Eve, and added into that was neither shall you touch it. So the thing is, when she touched the apple, she didn't die, and straight away assumed that God was a liar. So she ate it. So that is the first instance of someone... Adam to the word, and that was Adam obviously corresponding with Eve and passing the message of, well, don't eat yet, or, oh, don't even touch it. So she touched it, didn't die, and then assumed straight away God was a liar. And that's the same with Lordship Salvation. God has clearly said that we need to just believe on him to be saved, but with Lordship Salvation, that adding again to what God has said. They say you've got to repent of this, do this, do this, and everything else, 
and then you can lose sight. So this is significant in as much as that that that, that was the first instant that, that that someone added to what God said, i.e., by command to live, and that was broken straight away by Adam adding an extra command, which is don't even touch it, which made God out to be a liar. I hope you understood that. Yeah, great point, Bill. I totally agree. All right, Jackson, did you want to expound on that any, any further? Or? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm mainly just going to reiterate what Bill said, but you have to take God's message exactly as it is, was the whole moral of that, as I got it. You can't think, oh, let's improve upon the message and say, don't even touch it. Or let's improve upon the gospel and say you need to do more than believe. You have to repent of your sins or that kind of thing. Anytime you change it at all, despite what your intentions are, it's, it's going to not be a good result. In fact, it's going to be a, a horrible, terrible result, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's a, it is a good point. It's a, it's a distinction that few people would ca even catch. So uh, the fact that uh, Bill observed it and, and saw the significance of it is, is uh, very, very important. Uh, I, I want to get back to the, the question that, uh, we, that Dean asked about why would God even put the, these two trees there? And, and then Jackson's answer is that uh, so that man would have a free will choice, and free will is the only way man can actually have a true love relationship with God. Uh, so I want to get back to that and and I'll relate it to the Trinity because we talked about that in the very beginning. One to me one of the great proofs of the Trinity is the fact that the, the, the Bible says that God is love. Now if God is love, love cannot exist with, without an object. I mean that's why Allah you know, he couldn't be uh, uh, exist. Any singular God can't can't truly be God if God is love, because he wouldn't have an object uh, in eternity before the creation. There's no object for him to love. But we have um, a, a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they exist in this love for each other and love of, of itself, and therefore. Uh, you can say truly God is love uh, because of this. Uh, the, the Father has the Son as the object and the Holy Spirit and vice versa. Uh, but, uh, yeah, really, there had to be this uh, choice given man uh, so, that, so that even though God foreknows how everything is going to play out, uh, he did not control Adam and Eve and make them make his choices, but he knew what their choices would be, and he knew that we'd be having this conversation right now in this in this particular time. Uh, he he's uh, omniscient and he, he knows all the time, and yet he chose to to do this, uh, knowing that, that the fall would happen and all the horrible things that would happen throughout history because of the fall, and yet. God must have valued this free will choice so much that he he allowed all this to play out, knowing the choices that man would make. So he must really value this free will choice, and because that's the only way man can really have a true love relationship with God. Okay, we'll go on unless someone wants to uh, talk further about that. All right. Uh, oh, yeah. The, um, gosh, I don't want to move beyond that verse. It's the. I told you how important it was. Uh, verse nine. I'll read it again and then tell you what uh, I, the how why it's so profound to me. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, up until about two years ago, I did not understand the significance of the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil uh, the way I believe I understand it today. And I want to thank uh, Brother Mitchell Blankoff, even though 
you know, uh, we, we're not friends anymore because he's a Calvinist and we've had this falling out. Uh, he was the first person I've ever encountered that explained the tree of knowledge of good and evil uh, as the law. Uh, that's really what the law is. Uh, and, and the tree of life as grace or Jesus. And Jesus was hanging on a tree and in that way he is the tree of life because through only through Jesus and his death on the cross can we have everlasting life. So the tree of life is a picture of Jesus and the, and the cross and grace. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a, is a picture of, of following the law and, and, and now since, since I heard Mitch talk about it a couple of years ago I've heard a lot of people expounding on this and it was nothing I've ever heard before so I don't know if it's newly catching on or, or I'm just finding the right people now but I know that um, uh, brother um, uh, oh gosh what Jackson you have a great memory what, what's the name of the uh, the the guy that was uh, studying to be a Jewish um, um, Aaron Budgen. Uh, yeah, Aaron Aaron Budgen. Aaron Budgen had talked an awful lot about this concept that I've just explained. He goes into much greater detail. Uh, I'm seeing also on that uh, Grace uh, uh, Grace Fruits channel. What is the name of that? I just recommended. Uh, yeah, Grace Fruits. Grace Fruits, uh, they're talking about it a lot now too. Uh, and and this idea that I, I think I missed it. I missed this for, for many years. Now I see clearly. And, and, that, and, and Aaron Budgen makes the point, he explains it. See, God was made us to have this relationship where we're just living, living through him and, and, on, and on him, relying on him and, and not trying to uh, you know, accomplish things apart from him. The, good, the knowledge of good and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the law, that's man having a choice saying, okay, I don't want to just rely on God. I don't want to just, uh, you know, depend on God to, 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 you know, guide me. I want to, I think I can do it on my own. If you just tell me what the, the knowledge of good and evil, I can make those decisions on my own, and I'm sure that I can make the right decisions and uh, be like God. So that's, to me... Uh, it, to me, that was a, a very enlightening when I began to understand that, and I'm, I, I've been happy to find that there's numerous teachers I've found recently that are expressing that. So I'd like uh, Brother Jackson first to comment on that, if he's still there. Yes, it's quite um, it's quite an interesting quite a, quite a good an interesting insight. The only uh, the only thing I would ask about it is, do we? Do we really see in Scripture that that's what what it was? That that's what what um, the tree of knowledge of good and evil was? Like, do we see scriptural for it's a very good and interesting philosophy? But do we see scriptural support? I wonder that it is that. Well, I remember Paul says, "I wouldn't have known what what uh, what good or evil was until the law was given to us." Remember? Right, right, and that's a good point for it. I didn't. But, I'm not saying I, I'm taking the position that that's not scriptural I'm just saying that that should be that should be um, explained slash uh, given evidence of yeah it's uh, well like like many things in the scriptures some things are spelled out in black and white and other things you must surmise or you must infer or you must ice it um, you, you, you take it out of the scriptures uh, um, because even though it doesn't explicitly say it, it infers it. It's implicit. Uh, and and it's, it's things like, uh, I'll give you an example, the, uh, when we're going to get to the point where Adam and Eve were covered with the animal skin. To me, that is implicit that they could not cover themselves sufficiently and so solve the problem of their nakedness when they try to cover themselves uh, it, it, it wasn't satisfactory. They needed God to provide the covering, and it had to be a blood sacrifice covering. So, uh, to me, that is implicit that this is a picture of of uh, uh, the the contrast between man's works and God's grace, 
and the blood sacrifice that was needed. So that, that's a, there's many examples. We could probably come up with 20, 30 examples throughout the scriptures of these pictures that illustrate this, these concepts. Uh, so I asked Brother Bill to talk about the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the, tr the tree of life in, in that way. Yeah, I think I think you know it, it is very interesting. I think I probably am inclined to to to, to see that scenario as true. Obviously, we know that that Christ is life, uh, so we can, in metaphor or symbolism, see him as the the, the tree of knowledge, you know, the, the the tree of life. Okay, so so, but you know, as you say, the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we could also see as the law, because we already know that, that the Apostle Paul did even say that the, the, the law was the ministration of death. He, he, he clearly says that. And, and we know that the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil brought death, but the tree, you know, the, the tree of life brings life. So there is a, yeah, I think you're right, there is a clear picture there, you know, metaphorically speaking, a, a contrast between life and death. Christ or law, you know. So yeah, I'd I'd be inclined to agree with that that that, that scenario. Okay, brother Dean, do you have anything to say about this? And and do you, do you think that uh, we've at least addressed your question about why the tree is there? Um. Yeah, I mean, I I'm inclined to agree with that scenario as well. I mean, I never really thought that way, but yeah, that was pretty deep. Um, as for the tree, the noise of good and evil. Um, I read down to chapter three, not chapter three, verse one, and it says, "Now the serpent was more subtle than the beast of any beast of the field which the Lord God hath made." And why would you create? Why would you create a beast on the field if, if it was going to uh, get your best creation to disobey you? Why, you know, would you create a, create a beast like that? Well, well, we'll be com we'll be coming to that verse very soon. But that 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 really is uh, the same answer we just gave you. That God had to uh, put man in a position where he was tempted, so he could make a choice. Was he going to listen to God? Was he going to believe God? Or was he going to not believe God and and uh, go his own way? Because that was the test that, that man has to go through. Will you choose God in a relationship with Him, or will you choose to go your own way? Uh, and uh, so that, uh, that all fits together. Uh, yeah. Let's go on to uh, the next verse, unless uh, Jackson wants to elaborate further on that. No, I think I've already said my piece there. Okay. Um, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the, uh, and the, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Okay. And we've already discussed this whole situation quite a bit, but let's, let's take a moment just to see if anybody wants to elaborate on that. Brother Bill? Yeah, well, like I said I, I believe personally that ties in the scenario I, I, I said earlier that, that God gave this one proclamation: I right, just don't eat of this tree, which, which brings death. You know, and it not only was it a, a test of man's free will: is he going to choose to 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 love God and obey that one, that just that one command? Or is he going to freely choose to, to love himself and, and disobey that, that that one command? You know, so yeah. Brother Jackson, anything further to say about that? No, not not other than what Bill said. So. Okay, Brother Dean. Ah, uh, no, nothing else to say. Okay, let's go on then from there. Uh, Uh, so, but the important thing is, uh, Brother Bill emphasized this before, and it's worth repeating. It says, "Thou shalt not eat of it." And it says, "In the day that thou eatest thereof, 
thou shalt surely die. So there's three things that are significant in that one phrase, uh, that one verse, and that is uh, eating eating it, the day that you eat of it, and death will happen. Those are the three things that are really, really important to understand. Eating it and death on that same day. Okay, so let's go on. And the Lord God said, it is not good for the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them into, unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Let's talk about that. You, you muted that, Brother, Brother Luke. You're still there, Luke. It's frozen up. And you're muted as well. Uh, all right. Uh, so uh, I don't know how much you missed, but I'm curious. Imagine you're Adam. And God creates you, and he gives you dominion over all the creatures and over the earth. And, he, and then he's letting you name all these amazing creatures that you're meeting. What, what would you, that kind of experience be like, Brother Bill? That, that would have been absolutely wonderful. Absolutely wonderful that, that, that God you know, loved us that much. That you know, he created, not only has he created you to be a living soul, that you're in existence, but he's given you the privilege to, to name every single creature that he's creating and bring it before you to name it. What a privilege that is. And it may even be worth pointing out that, you know, with all the faults, you know, that Eve, you know, partook of the apple, you know, she she wasn't she wasn't there when that happened. So it's as if, you know, Adam had knowledge that Eve never had. You know, and this this perhaps contributed to Eve's fall and, and, and Adam's lack of, you know, explaining things in a bit more detail to her. But you know, yeah, Adam had everything. God created him, breathed in him, and not only that, all the other things, that, all the creatures that he was bringing before him. You know, he gave Adam that man the privilege to name personally. You know, it's amazing, it's phenomenal. You, you could do a whole. You could do a whole, you know, hangout just on that. It, you know, it's a wonderment. I love that verse. Mm -hmm. Okay, brother Dean, what what do you think of uh, the privilege of, of not only having dominion over the earth and all the animals uh, and and being able to name them? What an experience that uh, that must have been for Adam. What what a privilege and honor that that God has given him. Yeah, I mean. Actually, makes me quite envious of the actual situation itself. Um, it says to help meat for him, so he named all the animals. But also, I think might have been provided for food as well, mostly so he could eat. But yeah, I mean that was a totally remarkable. Well, I, I we're going to ask. I want to ask everybody uh, to answer again. You're, boy, you're just really. Every time you talk, you bring up a can of worms. Another one. Uh, I see your serpent there. I thought you'd introduce that serpent, Jackson, uh, at the proper time, you know, when we were talking mm -hmm. about the serpent. But you, well, you introduced him early. Yeah, actually, um, I kind of purposely don't want to because that might paint serpents in kind of a negative light, whereas this is a very positive thing. Because um, when I talked about naming the animals, this guy's name is Fames, by the way. I have him in one of my Osas Arminian videos, of which I do plan to make more. I've just been quite bogged down with things but like to see the amazing design in this animal right here like let me see you say hello to the camera fangs um just naming him i named him fangs because these snakes are rear fanged and it's kind of unusual that a harmless snake actually has fangs and this species does eastern hog nose so um i my guess is adam probably felt like this even only even more so because of all the uh all the different animals he got to name and sort of after any kind of personality 
that they kind of felt that they had. Well, as I watch you having so much fun with Fang, uh, Fang is plural. I could, imagine, I could really imagine if you were Adam, mm -hmm. if you were in that position, getting to name all these animals. Uh, you'd be having like a, a, a amazing time. Uh huh. Uh, what, what? How much fun would it be? Well, first of all, to first meet all the animals. I mean, mm -hmm. when I watch, you know, I, I've never been to Africa and, and been on a safari and or seen these animals in person. I've been to zoos. I don't really like the idea of a zoo. I don't think animals yeah. should be locked up in cages. Uh, but uh, I've seen a lot of animals. On television shows like the Discovery Channel and 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 around the world, the creatures from the insects to the reptiles to the mammals and and the sea sea creatures, the the creation is just mind boggling. Mm -hmm. Not only the variety, but the spectacular uh, uh, things you see that they're they're all capable of, and, and we know now because of uh, scientific advancements, the complexity of every creature, not mm -hmm. only the creature itself, but even down to the the um, the various um, systems and even cells of the creatures is so complex, and the DNA of everything, and the complexity of it is mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. And then we we uh, we know that uh, it would be so overwhelming. I'm overwhelmed and just jumping for joy every time I see some of these creatures that live so deep in the sea that are just so bizarre. You think, man, that is an amazing creation. And so uh, we're going to end here pretty uh, pretty soon, so, uh, but uh, let's make that the final thing. Just anybody who wants to say anything about the uh, various uh, uh, idea that Adam got to see all these creatures he got dominion we still have dominion as far as I know God never took dominion away from mankind it, it was transferred from Adam to all of the descendants and we have dominion so we have dominion over all of these creatures uh, brother Bill well yeah yeah we certainly do have dominion over them, but obviously at the fall a lot did change you know, and he, he changed again. Uh, you know, the times of the flood that that, that God placed in, uh, you know, these creatures to 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 fear men, in, in as much as that, you know, we have dominion over them. But you know, obviously, gradually over time, some some creatures don't fear us as much as they should do. But we did we did lose a lot of authority, you know, at, at the fall, and then obviously at the flood. You know, it's a lot of interesting stuff. A lot of a lot of information can can be just brought out about those scenarios. But yeah, you know, the truth is, God gave us you know the dominion over these these creatures, and gave us you know what a privilege. And you can see how much Jackson was enjoying his, his snake. What a privilege <laughs> it was to to name every single creature. Talk about love. Well, let's uh, let's make a note that uh, next week we pick up with Dean's controversial question. He doesn't probably even know that how controversial it is, but he's saying that God gave us dominion over animals, and that means to even uh, the ability to the right to eat the animals. And uh, so we'll have to discuss that and see if we agree with that um, at the beginning of next, next show. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Dean and uh, Jackson to say any final things here, and then we'll give an invitation of salvation uh, before we close. Brother Dean? Um, as a final thought, yes, I don't really have much to say, but that even though the fall happened, you know, um, even though we were yet sinners, you know, God commanded his love towards us, that Christ died for us, and that, you know, um, Jesus came to earth to die for you and he was raised on the third day and if you put your trust in that and that alone salvation you'll be forever saved uh, Amen uh, that, that's the gospel Brother Jackson uh, any final remarks on this idea of the dominion over, the, over the, all the animals on the earth and, uh, and then uh, we'll go into the uh, salvation uh, invitation 
Um, the only thing I'd like to say about the Dominion is I don't feel any guilt whatsoever for eating meat. Um, I don't really have anything to add besides that at this point, though. Okay. All right. Uh... Brother, Brother Bill, uh, my, my question for you, and, and the audience, can, I hope you'll pay attention, is uh, if, if I was not a Christian right now, and uh, I'm watching this, and, and now I'm curious and I'm interested in Jesus and, and uh, the Bible and uh, heaven, and I, I was wondering, well, okay, what is it? What is it that, that makes someone a Christian? How do you become a Christian? What's what? Why should someone become a Christian? Uh, what do I have to do so I can go to, to heaven? I want to go to heaven now, brother Bill. Yeah, well, the answer is simple, and we could trace it all the way back from Genesis to, to today. That that God created us in love and desired right from the beginning that that we have fellowship with Him and that we, we would love Him and and we would we would speak to Him. You know, Adam and Eve and, and God, they had communion. They spoke to one another, and, and they, they loved one another. And this is, this is God's desire from all, from times past and ages to ages, that, that, that we would have this fellowship restored, you know, since the fall, that we'd have this communion, you know, communion restored with God. And, and to, to simply, you know, to receive this communion with God, to receive this fellowship again, to receive this restoration of what was broken, but to receive this reconciliation is to believe, you know, that, that Jesus Christ loves you dearly this day. You know, realize that in your heart that you've fallen short because of the fall, and that's called sin. That means to miss the mark. If you humbly realize that we've missed the mark and we've fallen from this, you know, this beautiful relationship we've had with God, Realize the fact that he loves you so much that he made payment for your wrongs. And he done this by dying at Calvary. And that he was buried and that he rose again victorious the third day. Showing that he had power over sin, death and hell. And that he could, in actual fact, restore this relationship again. You know, if you believe those facts and whom they are wrought, which is Jesus Christ, you can be saved. You can be restored. You can have this relationship back to how it should be as it was in the beginning. And this is God's heart and all that it always has been, from ages to ages, to restore man, to have fellowship back with him. And it isn't complicated. You know, the, the question was posed, you know, to, 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 to Paul and Silas. You know, this is historical account. You know, they was captured and, and they was put in prison, you know, in, in Philippi. And, and a Philippine jailer, you know, he, he, you know, there was an earthquake and he was going to kill himself. Because in those days, if there was an earthquake, and, and prisoners escaped from a prison cell, you, you were sentenced to death. So he wanted to kill himself. But, but thanks be to God that, 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 that Paul, through unction, through, through the Lord himself, you know, stopped him killing himself. And he says, this is the jailer, an unsaved jailer. He said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And I simply said to him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. This is God's heart in it. Just simply believe on Christ this day and you can be saved and eternally secure and fellowship be entirely restored again. God has already promised a new heaven and a new earth. And what a blessing that will be, you know, that come that glorious day when he returns, that we'll be restored to our, our, our proper state, which is eternal, never dying, and have been in bliss with God forevermore. That's the greatest thing that could ever happen. And I pray that you receive this just simply. Just simply believe on Christ this day. I pray that you do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, that's uh, that's the, the biblical truth. Uh, if a person wants to know what the Bible says about these things, Bill just told you. But I have a question for Brother Jackson. Uh, uh, what, what do we say to all those people around the world who, who say, well, you know, I, I don't believe in Jesus, but I'm a good person. I, I, uh, you know, I, I try to do good. I, I even follow the Ten Commandments and, 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 the, and the, the Golden Rule. What do we say to all the, the, the people who are practicing their religions, like, like Islam 
or, or Hinduism, and and they're working really hard and thinking that well, if I'm uh, if I follow my religion well enough, that's that's all I need. What do you say to them, Brother Jackson? I would say that they are are contradicting what the Bible says about salvation because in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, it says that salvation is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And no amount of good works that we do will ever amount to God's perfection because the standard is not be a good person, have your good outweigh your bad. The standard is perfection. So I would challenge anyone who says that or thinks like what you said to really look at themselves and think, am I really perfect? Am I really without any sin at all at any point ever in my life that I could merit eternal life? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's true. Uh, so the problem is most people in the world, whether they're practicing a religion or just trying to figure it out on their own, most people think that if there's a heaven and God's going to judge them to get into heaven, they just have to be a good enough person and m maybe God will let them in. That's, that's the, the, the philosophy of the world. But the Bible says that's not God's way. That's man's way, trying to work their way to heaven through personal merit. So Jackson is perfectly correct that we need to understand that uh, we cannot get to heaven through personal merit. We have to... As, as surrender and say, I give up. I I cannot do it. I need I need to be saved. I need the Savior, and there's only one Savior. This is Jesus Christ. Now I want to ask Brother Dean to tell us. I uh, Brother Bill talked about this this death and the cross and this resurrection. Brother Dean, well, why is the the cross and the resurrection important? It's very important because. Um Without it, we are all doomed. Because the scripture has said, you know, our self-righteousness is our, our fluffy rags, that we all fall short of the glory of God. And without a sacrifice of our sins, we'll be doomed. So basically, Christ died for us, rose on the third day, and because of that, we are we um, have reconcil reconciliation of the Father. All we have to do is receive the free gift of salvation. And we do that by simply to believe in and putting our trust in what Christ did for us and self for self for salvation. Amen. That's all that's all true. So I would ask Brother Bill, if if I was right now considering, okay, uh, all right, so I put my faith in Jesus Christ and he paid for my sins and he rose from the dead, that proves that he's God and he and he had, he has the power of life and death. So if I put my faith in him, uh, that's that's what the Bible says I need to do. That's the thing I must do, and that's all that's required of me. But what happens if someone does that and then they decide tonight they're gonna they're gonna go out and commit a big whopper of a sin, Bill? What happens if they put their faith in Jesus, but then they go out and commit a big sin? Well, for sure, God is faithful, even when we're not faithful. So you know, the, 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 what gets you saved is is believing on Christ, all right? Because He is faithful, all right. That is our portion. And if we commit a sin, yes, we commit a sin. But the fact of the matter that Christ has already paid for that sin, not that we ever, you know, as Christians, advocate that we should go and do things, you know, malicious things or wicked things. But the point is, when you come to Christ, you are saved forever according to his promise and his faithfulness, not our own. So I would, you know, ask anyone out there, you know, believe on Christ. Let him come live inside you. You know, he lives inside you in, in, in the person of the Holy Ghost. You know, he is the one that will teach you. He is the one that will help you. And, and he is the one which will deals with these matters. In, you know, in regard to, as you just said, if you cause a crime or you do something wrong, it's him, the Holy Ghost, who will deal with this personally to you. If he needs to chastise you, he will. If he needs to build you up, he will. But, you know, the, the, the point of the matter is faith in Christ alone, his death, burial, and resurrection is what saves you for eternity. So I pray that you would put your trust in him and just let, you know, him deal with all these situations. Amen. 
So uh, I, I, if you if you've been watching this, particularly the the final ten minutes here, uh, I'm sure now you you understand what the Bible says about what we must do to have eternal life in the kingdom of God. And it, 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 in other words, you don't have to join a religion or become a religious person or follow some set of religious rules. There's one thing you have to do. You need to put your faith completely on the Savior. Don't put your faith in yourself, in your own performance. Put your faith on the Savior. And, and when you do that, he becomes your Savior. He will give you eternal life. He promises eternal life to everyone who believes in him completely. And he's faithful. God doesn't lie. He'll keep his promise. You will have eternal life in the kingdom of God. So, uh, in other words, trust Jesus to give you salvation. Then trust the Holy Spirit living inside you to start transforming your life. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, that I'm sure, every one of us here, I'm sure we could tell you how the Holy Spirit has over time changed us. I mean, look what we're doing right now. Uh, no one's paying us to do this. No one's forcing us to do this. And yet it's something we love to do. We want to talk about the Bible. We want to talk about Jesus. We want to associate with other people who love Jesus. Why? I didn't feel that way 30 years ago. But 28 years ago, Everything changed for me. I put my faith in Jesus. The Holy Spirit of God lives inside me, and it's been transforming me and changing me all my attitudes. And now I have a great love for the Scriptures and for fellow Christians and for Jesus. All right. Uh, I want to thank the panelists for participating. Uh, we, we talked an awful lot. We really only covered a few verses. I, I really thought that this topic of Adam and Eve would probably be like a, a one-show thing. I think it's going to take a lot of shows to get through this whole thing because there is so much to be said about each one of these verses here. So uh, thank you, panelists. We'll end the live broadcast now. And uh, for uh, everyone who has put their faith in Jesus, I ask you now just... Uh, um, now you need to learn to rest. Rest in this love and grace of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.